Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Sujit. A very warm welcome to all of you. In this series, we are going to go on a journey together. We are going to travel back in time to the ancient world to understand how our predecessors, how our ancestors, invented science. I'm sure that. you have both history and science as subjects at school but this is going to be different we are going to be looking at the history of science how and why did ancient people invent science we are going to follow their trail carefully and understand how they solved various mysteries in their quest to understand the universe we will not only have fun solving many important mysteries but we will also gradually learn to change the way we think learning science is difficult because science goes against our default common sense common sense tells me that the ground on which i am sitting is at rest but science tells me that the earth is not only rotating but rushing at an enormous speed around the sun 30000 meters per second that's the estimated speed can you believe that i don't feel myself moving at all when i'm sitting in a car or a train i can tell that i'm moving or even if i'm taking off in an aeroplane i can tell that i'm moving because if i open the car window or the train window of course i can't open the plane window but if i could i could feel the wind blasting my face but i don't feel any motion of the earth nor do i feel a massive wind and scientists are telling me that the earth is traveling at a speed of 30000 meters per second why should i believe that the earth moves at all why should i give up my common sense if you don't find science going against your common sense there is something wrong in the way you are learning it that is why learning science is such a transforming experience because it tears us apart from our common sense and changes the way we look at the world the earliest science that was invented was astronomy and so our focus in this series is going to be on the story of ancient astronomy and we will begin our journey all the way back in prehistoric times before any of the civilizations were born that is what we will start doing next time onwards in our second session in this first introductory session today i'm going to begin in the present and give you a taste of the type and style of content that we will be covering in future sessions So let me begin with a true story. The city of Los Angeles on the California coast is the second largest city in the United States by population. The largest being New York City. Home to Hollywood, sunny beaches and amusement parks like Universal Studios and Disneyland, the Los Angeles area is a treat to visit. especially for kids about 27 years ago on january 7th 1994 it was 4:30 am in the early morning hours when most of the city was asleep suddenly the sleeping residents were woken up by a nasty jolt the ground started shaking violently it was an earthquake of magnitude 6.7 in the darkness of the night as the shocked people ran for cover highways collapsed these pictures were taken later in the daytime but the damage happened in the night during those 10 or 20 seconds more than 50 people were killed and more than 8000 were injured life in one of the most famous and busiest cities in the united states screeched to a halt because highways had collapsed hospital buildings like this one 
were badly damaged and many houses were destroyed. Gathering outside at 4.30 a.m. on the streets that were suddenly devoid of power, many people felt that they were safe because they were outside now. But when they looked up, they were shocked. A giant, eerie, silvery cloud that they had never seen in their life stretched across the early morning sky. Many people were afraid that this scary cloud had something to do with the earthquake because it had never appeared before. So many people, many of them, went into phone booths and started calling emergency centers to report what they were seeing. They couldn't believe what they were told, that what they were seeing here was the normal appearance of the night sky and that the giant silvery cloud was the Milky Way. You couldn't blame the people for getting scared of the Milky Way because the night sky that they were accustomed to every night looked very different. The top image here shows what the sky looked like just after the earthquake. The bottom image shows what the Los Angeles sky looked like on every other night, including that night before the earthquake happened. So how could the earthquake cause such a drastic difference in the same sky? What do you think? Let me give you 10 or 15 seconds to think about the answer. The answer lies in the bright lights that emanate from the major cities at night. This is Mexico City, the capital of Mexico, and the most populated city in the continent of North America. Notice how much light is directed up into the sky. All this light gets scattered by the air in all directions. And as a result, the sky above the city appears to have its own faint glow. Here is a diagram that shows more clearly what's happening. So just like in the daytime, we cannot see the stars even though they are there because the light of the sun outshines them. What happens is at night, the sky glow from the city lights makes most of the faint stars invisible to us. You can see here that the light from the buildings in the city is going up. And then the air above the city scatters that light. And from different parts of the sky, the light reaches an observer who's standing somewhere in the city. And all that light is mixed up with the starlight that is coming from far away from these faint stars. And so you can't see those faint stars because just like the sun blocks out all the starlight during the day, the sky globe blocks out all the starlight or much of the starlight in the night. But if we go to an environment that is far away from city lights, then we can see things that we could never see while living inside or close to a city. When the earthquake happened in Los Angeles, there was a complete power blackout. The sky glow as a result was gone and the night sky appeared just like it would far away from the city. If you find it hard to believe how, how much light goes up in the sky from a city, Look at this satellite view of the world at night. You can spot dense concentrations of people because you can see their city lights even from space. For example, look at the look at the lights along the Nile River here in Egypt. Much of Egypt is a desert country with all the major cities located along the Nile River. So you by looking at the cities, you're actually looking at the uh, Nile River itself. France is somewhere here, and this spot here is the capital city 
of Paris. So if we zoom in, uh, this is the satellite view of Paris at night. Notice just how much light is emitted from the city into space, far beyond just illuminating the city. It is this wasted light that then blocks our view of the night sky. And there is a term for this unwanted light. It's called light pollution. It is light pollution that prevents us from observing the Milky Way and thousands of other stars in the night sky. Unfortunately, this makes people living in cities, which means most of the world's population, more and more distant from the mystery and beauty of the universe. Some cities have begun trying to reduce light pollution by changing the street lights. So instead of using lamps that emit light sideways and, and upwards, they've started using efficient street lights that only project light downwards. But still, if you are living in a city, chances are very high that you are cut off from the night sky. Let me ask a quiz question. The most powerful telescopes, right? Telescopes, as you know, are instruments used to observe the night sky. The most powerful telescopes are kept inside special buildings whose roofs can open whenever needed so that the telescope can look out at the sky. These buildings are called observatories. So why do you think observatories are located in remote places? For example, this is, this is Lick Observatory, an observatory that's located very close to where I live uh, on Mount Hamilton near San Jose in California. So think about why observatories are located in remote places. So the answer is that remote places are, by definition, far away from city lights. And so they are unaffected by light pollution. So many observatories are located on the tops of mountains, far away from cities. Such locations also have an additional advantage, which is that the air up in the mountains is thinner. Since the light coming from the stars is scattered by the air, having a thinner blanket of air above you makes the light scatter much less. So you can see the stars more clearly. The blanket of air that hugs the earth is called the atmosphere. And if you want to totally avoid light pollution, there is even a telescope that has been put completely outside the atmosphere of the Earth. And this is the Hubble Space Telescope, named after the famous astronomer Edwin Hubble. The telescope was launched by a rocket and has been orbiting the Earth since 1990. And some of the clearest images of the universe have come from the Hubble Space Telescope. Since most of you are in India, uh, this is the Indian Astronomical Observatory located near Leh in the Ladakh region. It is the highest observatory in India, about 4,500 meters above sea level. But the highest observatory in the world is University of Tokyo's Atacama Observatory. It's located in the Atacama Desert in Chile, in South America, at a height of uh, more than 5,600 meters above sea level. Here's another quiz question. You must have seen that the moon appears to change its shape on different days or different nights. Sometimes you see it as a full moon. At other times, you see it as a crescent. So. Would a sky with a full moon or a crescent moon be more suited for watching stars? Think about that. What, what would be a good night to go out to watch the stars when 
the moon is crescent shaped or when it's full moon so the answer is a crescent moon right uh, in fact the perfect night is a night when there is no moon at all uh, the light from the moon also makes it harder to see the faint stars clearly right so that's the reason why a night with a crescent moon is better for stargazing because less light is coming to us from a crescent moon than a full moon right think about uh, uh, what happens in the daytime when the sun is out there it's not like the stars are not there they are still there but the bright light from the sun blocks out all the starlight and in a similar way to a much smaller degree but still to a significant degree if you want to see the very faint stars it's harder to do that on a full moon night 